So I get to introduce um, somebody I met years ago on a bus. Actually, I just say that jokingly. Yeah, we were both homeless. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, there are several people in the room that were around back when I was doing bus tours in Richmond. And Daniel is one of them. Uh, we sort of started at similar times. I did way too much flipping and wholesaling. He just kept buying stuff and just keeping it. <laughs> much smarter than me. And um, then we went on to become partners in Bank Elimination Blueprint, which is where I've met some of you guys. And now we do Inner Circle together. If you're in here and you're in our Inner Circle, just raise your hand real quick. Thank you, guys. We love having you All in. All right. There is a, a QR code in the booklet, by the way. If you want to join, you should do that because, <laughs> I mean, it's really cheap, isn't it? We're, we're not good at pricing things no. as uh, evidenced by this event. Somebody, somebody said higher. yesterday that we need to raise our, our oh, <laughs> rate. 100%. I don't even remember who it was. But yeah. it's a give. So This um, is going up five times next year. So yeah, there you go. So get in it. now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, Daniel's uh, super smart. The... Hardest working person, believe me, that I have ever worked with. Incredibly focused. He doesn't have squirrel syndrome. Like, he doesn't see shiny objects and jump. He just takes something one inch wide and goes a million miles deep with it. And that's a good thing. Because you don't get diverted, right? I'll take it. Take it. Yeah. And uh, hardest working guy. He's also extremely honest. Honestly, I feel like... There aren't many people that I could, like, go to his house in Westham. I could, like, leave a pile of, say, $10,000 for the weekend and come back, and it's probably going to have more in it I'm Monday. I'm still when waiting for this experiment to happen, <laughs> by the way. No, it's true. You know? There are a lot of people, not everybody, Jeff Watson will tell you, like, you got to be careful who you partner with, right? I can tell you, Daniel's, like, the only person I've partnered with ever, and, and it's worked because he, he has very high integrity, okay? And he has a passion for teaching. And today we're going to talk about ground up development, something nobody in this space ever talks about. And the cool thing is, like, he's doing it. Like, I drive by the projects and I see them go from dirt to gigantic buildings now. So I just want to just say, everyone on your feet, give me a great round of applause for my, for my friend and my partner, Daniel Clayton. Okay. All right. All right. That's a, that's a nice way to get started, especially after I get stuck going after De David Phelps somehow, and now I've got a debt act to follow. Uh, especially when he was like, don't take on long-term debt, don't do long-term projects, and here I am, as like, ground-up development. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Th thanks, yeah. Um, no, everything, everything he says is actually really smart. It's not really in my presentation, but during Q&A, we can talk about how we approach debt. So we're going to talk about cash flow development today, specifically ground up cash flow. And everybody in this room already, sh if you're smart enough to have put yourself in this room, I feel like I'm going to preach to the choir. You should already know what's on this slide. All the wealth in real estate, historically, all the wealth in general has been built by people holding assets, not flipping, not wholesaling, not Seller financing, I'm sorry, somebody here is going to talk about seller financing later, so I don't mean to poo-poo on that, but real wealth comes from holding assets. It comes from ownership. It comes from long-term benefits of that ownership, right? Appreciation, depreciation, amortization, and cash flow. And cash flow to me has always been the sexiest part, right? It's reliable, it's dependable, it's predictable, it's scalable. You do a deal once, and you get paid forever. Hell, your kids can get paid from these deals, your grandkids. Now, whether that's a good thing, we can argue about that later. I'm not sure I want my kids to get paid for my deals or my grandkids. But that's the power of real estate, right? That's the power of holding assets. And my preference over the last seven to eight years has been to build assets rather than acquire them. We'll talk about why in a second. So, Today, I obviously can't teach real estate development in an hour, but we're going to talk about if you want to be in this business, how to build your team, and I'm going to show you how we find and identify development opportunities. And if you have no desire to develop real estate, which I can't blame you for because it's a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, patience, 
capital, it doesn't have to be your capital, but what I'm going to show you is still going to make you stronger in, in, in your ability to identify opportunities and flip them to other people and get paid referral fees. So really quickly, I'm not going to, Jim gave me an amazing introduction, uh, but my name is Daniel Clayman. I live here in Richmond. That's my family. The, um, that's my older kids, Sophia and Ethan. They, they look really innocent in that picture, but I assure you there are wildlings. And then this is baby Charlotte, who was born two weeks ago. So thank you, thank you, yeah, thank you. And this is how I get you guys to like me. I show you adorable babies. I've got puppies and kittens coming up next. So, so I, I run a couple of different businesses. I run a technology company. Re Rehab Valuator is a deal analysis, deal marketing, uh, fundraising and project management software for wholesalers, house flippers, and developers. I know we got inner circle members here. We got Rehab Valuator clients in this room, people using the software. Nice, all right. So again, with Jermaine Gersol as my partner, uh, we run uh, Inner Circle, which is a group mentorship, and it's really become more of a mastermind for investors. And again, we really suck at pricing things where they should be. So, you know, it's, it's really affordable. And then last but not least, I run a real estate development company. Now, we have a home building division where we build and sell houses to owner occupants, but the focus is and always has been on building cash flowing assets to add to my portfolio. And we build everything from duplexes to quads to larger apartment buildings to mixed use projects, which are a really big passion of mine because the right project in the right area with the right commercial tenant can make a really meaningful impact to that block, to the surrounding area, to the neighborhood. And I'll show you some other examples of this. And now we're scaling all the way into larger uh, apartment complexes. This one is going to break ground this summer unless we get screwed on financing, which is still possible. But this is 130 units uh, with 30 going up across the street. I, you know, I, I got started in this business. I didn't start out doing new construction. I started out doing basically nothing but renovate, gut renovations of historic 100-plus-year-old properties. This is all I did for the first seven or eight years, right? It's a great learning curve. And I built a decent portfolio, single family houses, duplexes, quads, a couple of mixed use projects. But after seven or eight years, I realized that I was burnt out, right? If you've ever restored a hundred plus year old property, you know how rewarding it can be to bring it back to its former glory. But there's really only three things that I realized I can count on from project to project. Mold, termites, Incredibly questionable foundations. I, li I literally had 20 projects in a row where we had termite damage in every single one of them. To the point where like, my termite guy was one of the first people that would show up to the property without us even inspecting it, because we knew that's what we got to deal with. So I got burned out. It's not a scalable way to build a portfolio. And I realized if I wanted to get to a couple of hundred units, 500 units, 1,000 units, I was never going to get there this way. And what I refuse to do, and I know some people in this room do it, but I will not buy tenant-occupied properties. It sounds good in theory. You're, it, you can scale quickly that way. You're buying something. It's already got tenants in it. It's in decent shape. You can cash flow from the day that you close in the property. Sounds, sounds great. I've tried it, and every time that's happened, what, you inherit not only poorly underwritten tenants from, your, from the previous owner, poorly screened, you're also inheriting a lot of deferred maintenance problems. Problems that are not obvious, right? The heat pump is in good shape, it's eight years old. It should still work, right? Roof is in decent shape, it's 12 years old. It should, it, it's fine, it'll be fine for a few more years. Just collect your rent checks. But what ends up happening is you're playing a game of whack-a-mole every single month with maintenance issues and tenant headaches. And all the cash flow that you think you're getting is going right back into the property. So it's not a model that I endorse. My goal when I turn the property over to a tenant, whether I do a gut renovation or new construction, is it needs to be in such condition where I fully do not expect to hear from them for five, six, seven years, except for, hey, I forgot what address I should be mailing my rent to, literally. And, and we accomplish that through new construction. That's why I pivoted to new construction. I get to design a product that 
I'm truly proud of, right? Like, we choose to do something full-time with our lives. We should be putting a product out there that we're truly proud of. We're, we're proud to give people to live in, right? Places where I would live in myself. Well-designed, great floor plans, efficient, the right bedroom to bathroom ratio. Like, I'm done with three ones, four twos, three one and a halves. If we have a bedroom, we have a bathroom, right? It, because that's what I would want for myself. The right unit mix. If I'm designing a multifamily property, we get to put the right unit mix in there between studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, because we know what the market wants. I'm not inheriting somebody else's building that's poorly laid out. Energy efficient. One of the top reasons why your tenants will leave you is what? It's high energy bills. It eats into their cost of living. It also caps how much you can raise their rent because the total money that they're paying for their housing is determined not just by the rent that they pay you, but what they're paying you in utilities. Or not, they're not paying you utilities, but what they're paying out in utilities. I put in bold, properly soundproofed. If it's more than a single family house, one of the top reasons, again, your tenants will leave is noise. They don't want to hear their neighbors above them, next door to them. Every, we, we are almost, and, and this, is a, this is poor timing with this analogy, given what's going on in the world, but we're almost like a refugee intake center for people that are coming from us from like shitty apartment buildings. Because that's, they tell us, like, we're moving into your property because we're tired of hearing our neighbors next door argue, watch TV. We know why people are moving into our properties. So we spend a lot of money and we pay a lot of attention to soundproofing, walls, ceilings, and we're constantly experimenting with additional things we can do to soundproof better, right? We're constantly testing to see what's working. Again, maintenance free. If we pay a lot of attention to how we build, and we do, we have a maintenance free portfolio. And obviously COVID threw the entire predictable thing, you know, in, uh, that's, that's out the window, but still, Apples to apples compared to rehabbing, this is a more predictable process in terms of costs and in terms of timeline. Again, relatively, apples to apples. Nothing is predictable anymore. We're, we're, done. we're done with having a predictable life. And they get to apply a greater leverage than if I were to acquire assets and put 20, 25% down, right? And at the end of the day, it's just much more scalable. So, Again, I build larger projects, but our sort of bread and butter is duplexes. You can build them by residential code, which means you can build them cheaply. Still, even today, I, I'm, I'm happy to share my numbers, right? But you can build them affordably. But it's a much more efficient product than a single family rental. I haven't been able to make numbers pencil out on a, on a when you hear traditional build to rent, everybody thinks of what? single families, right? You're developing like a subdivision out somewhere and you're putting roads in and sidewalks and you're putting single family rentals there. I haven't been able to make those numbers work in Richmond. Infill development with duplexes is much more attractive from a, from a number standpoint. I get to amortize the cost of that roof, the walls, the foundation, new utilities over two units. And my dollar per rent here, my dollar per square foot in rent here is much more efficient than if this was a single family home. But again, we get to build it by residential code, which lowers the cost tremendously. And, the, and we built a great product. We pay a lot of attention to design, to kitchens. I, I overspend on finishes. Granite countertops, leathered granite, quartz countertops, large oversized kitchens, big open layouts, right? Nice hardwood floors, modern light fixtures, bathrooms, um, Every time we can, we try to put a walk-in closet there. Again, we pay a lot of attention to the quality of people's lives, especially since COVID, people are spending so much more time at home, right? We wanna give them great, comfortable places to live, so we pay a lot of attention to layouts, getting rid of hallways that are needless, making sure they have big closets, big pantries, lots of storage space. This is a more uh, modern project I finished recently, which is four duplexes side by side. Again, like you don't see people doing this. Outdoor ceiling fans, large oversized decks. Uh, this one had 12-foot ceilings on the second floor. Everything we do, we get, it get pre, gets pre-leased three months before we finish. People walk in, they see the layouts, we show them pictures. This is what we've done in the past. This is what this place will look like. They sign leases. 
it is very rare for us to finish a project right now and not, and I do not exaggerate, have U-Haul trucks pulling up ready with tenants because everything is pre-leased, right? So this one again, big kitchens, uh, quartz countertops. This is, this is something that's really important to us. We, we make it a point to build a superior product in the marketplace. Again, large outdoor decks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why I've kind of become an evangelist for, and I feel like an evangelist with this piece. I should be walking up and down the aisle, <laughs> passing like a collection plate out or something. Uh, but this is, this is why I've become an evangelist for this business model. Because if you build a truly high quality product, you're going to have an easy time leasing it, right? People, people fight to live in our units. And now, like, rental demand in general around the country is on fire, right? David was talking about this. There's a major housing shortage. There's a need for this. There's a need for this in almost every market. There's a need for more rentals. But let's say you're in a situation where now there's a lot of supply. If you build a superior product, you're still going to have an easy time leasing it. When you have an easy time leasing something, you get to charge premium rents. What do premium rents attract? High quality tenants. People with great jobs, W-2 incomes, good credit scores. People that make good financial decisions. People that are financially responsible. Which means what? They pay their rent on time. Right? Oh, no. Too fast. So they pay their rent on time, but not only that. You already have a maintenance-free product because it's new construction. But now these people actually treat your property with the pride of ownership. They don't beat up your property. So you have very low upkeep. And because you give them a great place to live, they stay there for a long time. What's the number one cost in your, like how many people here already have rentals? I'm assuming a lot. Okay, so what's the biggest cost in your property management business, in your landlording? Turnover, right? You want them all to stay, unless they suck and then you want them to leave, right? But you want good tenants to stay, so we have high retention because people love living in the product that we give them. And in turn, me as a landlord, me as a property owner, me as a property manager, and we have a property management, in-house property management team that just manages my properties. We have a happy life. We're not chasing tenants for money. We're not evicting people, right? We're not dealing with problem tenants. We're not dealing with ridiculous headaches that you typically associate with like landlord horror stories. And in turn, we have a portfolio that not, not only can we scale, we actually want to scale, right? Because why would you want to scale a headache? Why would you want to scale a, a nightmare portfolio? So, and I do not exaggerate when I give you these numbers. For the last 10 plus years, we are at 100% occupancy. We do not have vacancies. Even through COVID, we are 100% collected, 100% with the exception of one restaurant that had to shut down for six months and we gave him a voluntary rent credit. With the exception of that one tenant. Wait, I haven't evicted somebody in 10 years. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Where do you go? Like what, literally, 10 years I haven't evicted somebody. In Virginia, we have what's called a five-day pay or quit. Now it's 14, right? Is it 14 now? It's the first legal action you take when somebody's behind on rent. You send them a notice saying, we're putting you on notice, we're now going to initiate eviction proceedings if you don't catch up. I haven't sent one of those out in five years. We're 100% collected by the fifth or sixth of the month. And we, we typically target 80% annual retention. Sometimes we hit 70, sometimes we hit 75, but most of our tenants stay, right? What, what prevents us from having a higher retention is top of the market rents that we charge, right? Because sometimes people will go somewhere cheaper, maybe their life circumstances changed, et cetera, et cetera. But we typically have very high retention. And, and again, like I, I probably don't even need to have the slide here because most of you guys understand this. Most of you already have rentals, but you don't need to be like a big developer. You, you build or whatever, acquire 10 of these over the next couple of years, for most people, and these duplexes, for me, on average, clean cash flow right now, seven to 800 bucks a month. Some new ones we just leased out, they're cash flowing over $1,000 a month, clean, after everything, after I take 10% off of rents from my maintenance reserves. You don't need a, you don't need a big portfolio, right? Like, everybody in this room is capable 
of building a portfolio where you never have to. How many people have full-time jobs here? Okay, yeah, get rid of those. <laughs> I mean, unless you really love it, right? Um, you don't need a lot of these. But what really gets my juices flowing, what I really love doing, and if you're in our inner circle tribe, you've walked this with me probably a couple of times, but doing larger, meaningful projects, projects that really have the potential to change the landscape of neighborhoods. This is a building that we're finishing now with, with the historic rehab next door, which I did after I swore that I would never do a historic rehab. Um, but we, we wanted to control the whole block. This is gonna have 25 apartments. Eight out of those are Airbnbs. And then 7,000 square feet of commercial space with seven different tenants. There is already a juice bar, there is a yoga studio in there. It's like the most hipster place ever. Um, <laughs> we're, we're adding a ice cream parlor, we're adding a co-working space, we're adding a ramen noodle shop, we're adding a high-end cocktail lounge that's going to look like this. This is from the designers with outdoor patio, sidewalk seating. So when this project is finished, this block, this neighborhood is going to be literally one of the most amenitized, walkable, funnest places to live in Richmond. So this is the kind of stuff that in, in I obviously had to wait and scale into that type of project, but this is what really gets me excited because we're doing meaningful development, right? Projects that will be there for 50, 60, 100 years and massively impact how so many people live, work, and play, right? Which is kind of the definition of mixed-use development. So for, for the rest of this presentation, what I figured I would do is I would go over some top roadblocks if you want to develop, if you want to build rentals. You know, you need a team, you need to be able to find land, and we're probably not gonna have time to talk about money unless, but all of you guys have money already, so it, it's fine. So let's talk about team, right? What, what I love about development is, after doing this for 12 years full time, there's still far more I don't know than there is that I know. The, the learning curve is tremendous. I wake up every day and I, I literally feel like a fish out of water. Especially if you scale the type of projects you're doing, especially if you continue challenging yourself in the scope of projects that you do. The learning curve never stops and it's always like this, right? So the way you make up for your lack of knowledge, the way you make up for your lack of experience is by surrounding yourself with a great team, right? It's a team sport. And the quality, I can't drive this home enough, right? The quality of your product is everything and your team is going to determine the quality of your product. So this is what, this is what your team should look like. Um, I, I get emails, people see some videos that I have online about you know, some duplexes that I built, and I get, I get emails from people across the country, they're like, hey, can they buy your plans? Can they buy your architectural plans? It always strikes me as a weird question. The, the answer is always no. But you need to find a good local architect in your market that understands your local zoning, your local building codes, your local construction methods, and your local architectural styles, right? And work closely with that architect because they are going to determine the quality of the product that you build. Don't buy some random plans online. I mean, sure, you can get an idea for some floor plans from a website, but you're going to need a local architect to work with you and get you through permitting, right? Legal and architectural is now where you cut corners, all right? You're going to need a general contractor, and we'll talk on the next slide about how to find a good general contractor unless you're one already. You're going to need a surveyor to create an initial survey of your property and to also help you through construction. You're going to need a soil engineer. Whenever we put land under contract, we will typically do soil testing. We will drill that soil and ensure that it does not have soil conditions that will make it costly or cost prohibitive to build on. Excess fill. So for example, in Church Hill, where I do a lot of my development, they for decades have had this ingenious way to demo houses. It saves a ton of money. It's really smart. You, you, you will want to write this down. 
they would demo the house and collapse it into the basement and then cover it up with dirt. Which, which is great when you're doing the demo, right? It's not great if you're me trying to, trying to dig footers and put a foundation in there, right? So soil testing will let you know. Now, that's not a deal breaker if we find that, but I now can budget excavating that stuff out, pouring more concrete in to, to get my footers in, right? Again, uh, you're going to need a real estate attorney. You're, you're going to need a good local real estate attorney to work closely with. And then the number six, I would say, is probably just as valuable on my team as an architect. So zoning consultant, and sometimes you will see number five and number six be the same thing. A, a real estate attorney can be a land use attorney as well. But a zoning consultant on my team is somebody that is exceptionally valuable for a number of reasons. If I have a piece of land I'm looking at, and I have questions about, hey, what can I build here with this zoning? What does this zoning mean, right? He's the person I turn to. I call during my due diligence phase, and I say, hey, what does the zoning allow me to do? What can they build here by right? Is it two units, four units? Is it a mixed use building? Do I have to build commercial here? Because sometimes you will come across land where you may not want to build mixed use because it's a crappy location for, for a business. It's just not a good location, but the zoning will require you to put commercial there. That's a landmine, right? That's, that's a problem. So zoning consultant helps me during my due diligence phase. And we do a lot of rezonings and when we talk about identifying development opportunities, I'll show you examples. We do a lot of rezonings in my business, special use permits, zoning variances, etc. That is the person that handles all my paperwork, applications. They will go, they will meet with the local city planning department, zoning department, council people. They will go and have meetings with neighbors on my behalf. You know, when like the torches and pitchforks come out and, you know, like they go and do that for me. Right? And it's a lot harder to yell at the, guy, at the guy that's not a developer. Right? So like if I show up and we're doing some kind of rezoning that some, some neighbors are nimbying, it's, it's, it's harder to yell at him than it is at me, right? because he's just a consultant. And, and they can also act as an expediter for us. So when we file a plan of development, when we file for permits, they can act as an expediter. So in your market, this is, this is likely going to be somebody that worked for the county or for the city, in their zoning, in their planning, and then got tired of it and went into the private sector, and then now consults with developers, right? Invaluable member of our team. And then if you're building by commercial code, you're gonna need a civil engineer, you're going to need a mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineer to draw up your plans. And this is where we start jumping into why is commercial construction so much more expensive? Well, just for me to get permanent, I now have to have somebody draw my mechanical electrical plumbing drawings. Right? You're going to need a structural engineer, and then you're going to need suppliers and subs. And even if you're working with a good general contractor, I still recommend sourcing as much materials as you can on your own. Even when we work with GCs, we still supply some of our subs, people that we trust. Or a GC will, will have a bunch of bids and I'm going to say, wait a minute, I know a guy that's, that can do this better and cheaper. So we still, we don't blindly trust our general contractors to get all the materials and mark them up needlessly or supply us blindly with their subcontractors, right? We, we work with them together. So if you're brand new, right, if you're brand new to rehab and your construction, you're going to need to find a good general contractor. Good luck. Uh, it's, it's not easy right now to find a good GC. They're in demand, right? Now, as our world changes, I think over the next 12, 24 months, you're gonna see a lot less construction happen. It's a longer conversation, but as interest rates go up, costs continue skyrocketing. GCs may be more available, but then the problem is your numbers might not pencil out on some deals, right? But every single contractor and every single supplier that Every single subcontractor that I've ever had a successful relationship with has only come from one place, Angie's List. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> I'm just saying if you guys are paying attention. Um, it's been through referrals from people I trust, right? People that I know, other developers. Um, 
other, other builders in my market, people that have skin in the game, people that have used these contractors before, it's only ever come from one source. So go network with those, go, go talk to other people in your market. Um, and you, you're inevitably going to come across people that hold their cards close to the best and they don't, don't want to share their contacts. Don't be friends with them. Be, be, be friends with people that share information, right? Obviously, you can get referrals from other local professionals, architects, engineers. What I did was, when I was starting out, and you can do this in your market, if you drive around and you see a project that looks good, you can pull over. It's a huge pet peeve, like I'm recommending you something that we hate, right? It's a huge pet peeve of ours. When people, random people pull up to our construction sites and go talk to our subs or our GC and try to get business cards, like we hate it. But when I started out, I, I met a lot of people this way. I would drive by a site, I'd see guys up on the roof, I'd, I'd be like, what's up? You know, and, and I'd meet people this way. But just be careful and like, don't, don't get punched. Uh, not, not everybody likes it. Um, if you're already experienced with rehabbing, or if you're, a, if you're a general contractor, you just don't really have much experience in new construction, you can do what I did when I started out. I had a lot of experience with rehabbing, but the first part of the project is where my learning curve lacked. It's, the, it's getting out of the ground. It's site work. It's new utilities, right? It's getting your footers in the ground, pouring your footers, foundation, pouring your concrete slab. So I didn't want to pay another GC to do the whole job for me. I didn't want to waste that money. So I hired another general contract, and I said, I'm going to pay you cost plus for the first part of the job just to get me out of the ground. Then when there is a foundation and you have a set of drawings, it's easy, right? It's easier than rehabbing. You, you, you literally just go off the drawings. So he did this for me for, went on a number of projects and I was able to follow along, learn. But I also saved a lot of money because I only paid them, at that time it was 12% of cost. You're never gonna see that again. Um, I paid 12% of cost just on that portion of the project. And then I took over as a GC. So that's something you can do if you already have a lot of experience rehabbing, you just don't know how to do that first phase, which, which is challenging, right? You need to learn. Now we have general contractors do everything for us because it's not scalable for me to run 10, 12, 15 projects. So now GCs do everything. But at the time, I was doing one or two projects. I wanted to do it myself. All right, so now let's, let's, let's get to the funner part, right? Let's get to finding and identifying development opportunities. So th this should be a big takeaway, right? E uh, more so than traditional searching for properties, marketing, the things you guys have been taught traditionally to do for single family homes, for apartment buildings. Finding development opportunities is as much about spotting things that other people don't see as it is about your traditional searching. So what does that mean? Um, I'm gonna show you some examples, but I, I want to point out that some of the stuff I'm going to show you, if you have no interest in developing, if you have no interest in building, you can still apply these skills of spotting things that most people are not spotting to, to just monetize these opportunities in other ways. If you're marketing as a wholesaler, like wholesalers usually ignore land, they ignore these opportunities. If you're looking at rehab opportunities, if you're talking to homeowners to buy their house, there's some opportunities that you're not spotting right now. So, Two major keys to success. One, it's really truly knowing your zoning in your market. And there's two components to that. One, you've got a piece of land. By right, what can I build on this piece of land? What does the zoning allow me to build right now by right? Is it a single family home? Is it a duplex? Is it a 100 unit apartment building? The second component to that, and this is where the fun really, this is where the money is made is what are my avenues for changing the zoning? What are my avenues for getting more density out of the zoning? What are my avenues for getting a higher and better use out of this land? There are limitations. If you've got a single family lot, you're not gonna build like a 100 unit apartment building there, usually, right? You may be in a neighborhood where neighbors will protest against anything you try to do. The planning department in your local county may not let you do anything here or maybe they want to see more density in this neighborhood, right? So knowing those things and knowing what the different avenues are for changing that zoning. Is it just a blanket rezoning? 
is that, you know, in Richmond we have what's called special use permit. In Henrico it's called a conditional use permit. Is it a zoning variance? So knowing all that stuff and knowing how far you can push the envelope, that's where the real money is made. And value travels hand in hand with that knowledge of zoning. Because you're going to look at it and you're going to say, this is a single family lot by right. I can build one house on it, it's worth $50,000 to me. That's the most I'm willing to pay to the seller. But you also know that you can rezone it, you can split that lot and get two houses out of it. So in your mind, you, it's actually worth $100,000, right? And that's how you make offers. So this is what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to fly through some of this because you guys all understand the power of the network. Jim loves to say network is, is equals your net worth. And that could not be more true when it comes to anything. But, but having opportunities find you, it's very powerful for that as well. And, and I've always believed this, right? The, like I am, I am known as the person that's ground up real estate in like three zip codes. That's it. That's it. That's all I do, right? So when people come across opportunities in those zip codes, I'd like to think that oftentimes I'm one of the first people that they think of because I'm known as the guy that does that. So the fewer things you're known for, the better and more targeted opportunities that will come your way. And I, I think when it comes to anything in life, it's better to be known for doing one thing really well than doing like 50 different things. Like I'm always skeptical when I meet somebody and they're like, yeah, I wholesale houses, I do some rehab and flips in like three states, you know, I'm buying an apartment building in California. Like, are you doing any of those things well? Would I, ever, would I ever pass you an opportunity that I need to close knowing that you will actually close on it? So we don't like jacks of all trades, right? So your network, keys to success, it, just like any other form of marketing, it's a game of consistency. It's a game of numbers. Right? It's not just a matter of talking to as many people as you can. It's a matter of talking consistently to those people and constantly staying in front of those people so that when opportunities do hit their desk, right, you're the first person they think of. Again, it goes back to my previous slide. Be clear and specific about what you want when you talk to people. And then obviously offer incentives. So as an example, we again have a home building division where a single agent always lists my houses when we build them. When I talk to other agents, I say, hey, if you bring me opportunities, if you bring me off-market land that I can develop, I'll pay you whatever fee you want, but I'll also give you all the listings in the back end when we build these houses. That's a powerful carrot to give to somebody. So be creative, right? Make it worthwhile for people to give you referrals. In your network, you're going to have wholesalers, you're going to have brokers, you're going to have all kinds of real estate professionals, and you're going to have the county. Wholesalers. It really, it's, a really, it's really a numbers game right now. There is more wholesalers than ever. Very few of them have deal flow. Even fewer of them have consistent deal flow. You gotta talk to like 100 to get three deals, right? So it's a numbers game. One of the things that I've started doing was nurturing relationships with newer wholesalers. Oftentimes when wholesalers find land, they ignore it. They don't know how to value it. They don't make offers on it. So what I, what I tell them is, look, I, if you come across a deal that you don't know how to put a number on, send me the address. I've never gone around anybody in my entire life. You will never find anybody, right? I'm not going to screw you out of this deal. What I will do for you is give you a number. I will give you a number that I'm willing to pay for this piece of land if it, it's in my buy box. And you can safely take that number, take out your whole selfie, and go make an offer to, to the seller, right? It's very powerful. I've done a lot of deals that way because otherwise these are opportunities that wholesalers ignore. They don't know how to value land and they just pass on them. They pass on these leads. So, brokers, um, especially if you're looking for commercial opportunities, go to loopnet.com. Forget what's in the market, right? There may not be anything good listed on loopnet, but you're going to see a list all the active listings, you're going to see who all the active brokers are in your market with their contact information. Reach out to them. Build those relationships. Take them out to breakfast. Take them out to lunch. Take them out to coffee. Build those relationships with them. So that hopefully when new deals come across their desk, again, you get one, you get one of the first dibs on it. County relationships. That's where you're going to get your tax delinquent lists. These are great lists to market to. 
right? For houses also, but a lot of tax delinquent properties end up being vacant lots. So that's where you're gonna get your tax delinquent lists. There may be surplus properties. There may be properties that they're holding that they've designated for affordable housing, and you can become their preferred development partner. And these relationships are also gonna be valuable when you develop, because you need to get through permitting, you need to get through your rezoning. So building those county relationships is invaluable either way. Again, it's a, it's a game of follow-up and it's a game of consistency, right? I mean, you can build a very simple spreadsheet with three tabs, wholesalers, brokers, and other professionals with their names and then for every, have a column for every quarter. Do they follow up with this person? Eventually, there's, it's a snowball effect, right? I, I, I have deals sent to my inbox like every single day right now, but it doesn't happen overnight. Most of them are not good deals, but you know, it's, it's still something. Direct mail, you guys all know how to do direct mail. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Everybody, you know, there's a million data sources out there. List source is the one that everybody's familiar with. You can very easily go to list source. You can go to property, under property type, property type select vacant land. And for any given zip code, you can pull up a list of all the vacant parcels in your market and you can send them direct mail. You can skip trace them and you can call them, you can text them. If my number comes up, please take it off. <laughs> David is gonna kill me. I still have like three things in my personal name and I freaking get calls every single day. It's, it's, and it's always a different number. It's so frustrating. Um, if you want to fish with dynamite, just mail all the vacant lots. If you want to be more selective in your targeting, again, tax delinquent lists are great probate lists. You can simply take that list in list source and narrow it down to out-of-state owners and having bought X number of years or longer because those are the ones most mo likely motivated to sell and the ones that haven't overpaid, right? If you have no money for lists, if you have no money for marketing, you can do online driving for dollars. This is uh, our local Richmond City GIS map, and you probably have something like that in your county. You can go online and go to a specific neighborhood and pull up a satellite view, and you can literally drive, virtually drive a neighborhood and identify all the vacant parcels. When I started hunting for land eight years ago, I got a ton of deals this way. I would send out 15, 20 letters at a time, very targeted. Every piece of land I was very, very interested in, I get one or two deals from it. It cost me nothing other than licking some stamps. I, what's that? What, I mean, well, you don't have to drive anywhere here, right? Just sit, sit on your butt in front of your laptop and drive the neighborhood. But you can pull up all the information, right? There's the owner, there's their mailing address. Their mailing address is usually not gonna be the same as the land, as the vacant parcel, right? You can pull up all the zoning information. You can see when they, when they bought it last and how much they bought it for, because there are gonna be situations where you don't wanna bother sending them a letter. And, and don't overthink your, your marketing, all right? This is, this is what I would send out to people. It's not on a yellow pad or a postcard. It's a very professionally written, straight to the point letter. This is what got me all my deals. This one got me a piece of land that I bought for 140 grand that we're gonna put 32 units on. It's worth 750 right now. Stuff works. Right? Given how hot the market is, it's going to work not quite as well as it did seven or eight years ago. But you can do this very easily. All right? Tax auctions. These have gotten kind of crazy lately. But I've bought a ton of deals at tax auctions, and even in the last 18 months, I've been able to snag a few deals. Right? Less people bid on land than the houses because most people, what, they don't know how to value land. Most people don't develop. You can still here and there, you know, you know, get deals at tax auctions, but it's it's going to come back. Everything swings. Everything is cyclical, right? There's going to be a time when you can buy really good deals at tax auctions again. People fall behind the property taxes all the time, so there, so it's a never it's a never ending stream of leads. In in Richmond City, there is a tax auction quarterly now, right? So it's three, four auctions a year and land is easier to bid. At tax auctions, you typically, what? You can't get into the house. You have to bid it blind. Well, with land, there's, you don't have to break into a house. So that's, 
That's important. All right? No, no splinters. I, I stole it. I had to give credit. I'm not associated with this website, but I, had, I stole their map. I really liked it. Uh, you're, so tax auctions, you can be able to do this in deed states and the redeemable deed states because you want to actually take possession of the land. You don't want to lien. You, you do not want to own a lien. You're going you're gonna to get paid on that lien, right? But you're not going to be able to develop on that property because you won't own the property, most likely ever. So you're going to be able to do this in red states and yellow. That's yellow, right? That's not orange. Sure, redeemable deed states. And Virginia is one of them. Now we're getting to the fun stuff. This is the stuff that I really love to do because that's where you start to get really creative. Uh, Carve-outs and lot splits. And I use that, those terms kind of interchangeably. But this is where you start finding a lot of overlooked opportunities. Whether it's on your land. I mean, this is a rich room. You guys all have property, right? You, like most of you are landlords. You may have land you're sitting on now that you're not monetizing properly, right? So on your own deals, but also on land of sellers that you're dealing with, often very overlooked opportunities. And you can split lots either by right or through some type of rezoning. This is an example of the, these were single parcels in blue and red. Blue was my neighbor, red was me. And you can see other lots on this block were also large. We both owned these houses with these huge side yards. I owned my house for 10 years until one day I woke up and I realized, hey, that's really valuable land. And my neighbor had the same epiphany at the same time without us talking, so I, I don't know how that happened. But we both applied for special use permits to split off these side yards. I incredibly valuable. So the house on the left is a rental that I owned since 2009 that I bought at tax auction. The house on the right is what we built. In this case, I sold it because the market here was so hot. It didn't make sense to keep this as a rental. So we sold this house three weeks ago for $430,000. So this extra piece of land I was sitting on for 10 plus years that I realized one day, hey, I should do something with it, it was worth six figures, right? How many of those deals are out there? They're, they're out there. This is a more interesting example. This is a buy right carve out. So that's a satellite view of a old school in Richmond City that was converted to a retirement home. So what did schools used to have that retirement homes don't need? Playgrounds, right? Playgrounds. Parking. Older people don't drive as much, don't own cars as much. So this was, this was purchased by, by a hedge fund out of New York, and I know those guys, I'm friendly with them, and they, they called me up. And they said, we've got, we just bought this thing. It's got all this extra land that we'd like to monetize for our investors because we'd like to give them a higher rate of return. Are you interested in looking at it? I said, yeah. It's in, it's in Manchester. It's an amazing neighborhood. So we looked at this. This is the existing building. And the parcel in blue is what we split off. And this summer, we're going to put a 16-unit mixed-use building there with 15 apartments. And they're going to be gorgeous. Big, great layouts, great finishes in the corner commercial space. So this came from my network and it's just vacant land that was being massively underutilized. So when you do a buy right split, there are two components to it. One, what you split off has to be buildable by right, right? So the land that I split, I can build 16 units there by right. But the other component to it is what I leave behind has to stay conforming to zoning. So if the zoning says that you need a thousand square feet of land for one dwelling units, and that nursing home has a hundred units, I have to leave them with no less than a hundred thousand square feet of land. Otherwise, what I have now is buildable, but what I'm leaving them is now non-conforming and they're in a bad situation, right? Because if they ever try to go sell this, they're gonna have a problem. So there, there's two sides to buy right splits. It's not just about what you take, it's also about what you leave behind. Does that make sense? Okay. So you can carve off from your own properties. Again, look at your current portfolio. You're, you're likely in a market that's significantly appreciated since you bought your rental. If you've, got, if you've got a large piece of land, it may be worth something. When you're talking to sellers, even if you're just marketing to, for single-family houses, you're going to come across houses that they just want way too much for, and you're passing on those deals. Start looking at their land. 
right? Start, start looking at other things. Don't just look at the house anymore. Because while you may not be able to buy the house, you may be able to negotiate with them and buy a side yard, buy, you know, get them to split the lot, whatever. And always, if this requires any kind of rezoning, obviously make your contract contingent on that rezoning going through. That way you're not risking anything, except for a little time and, and a little money to file your rezoning request. So, you know, who, who can you carve off from? Homeowners, retirement homes. If you're in an old city like Richmond, you're gonna have a lot of what I just showed you. Old schools, old churches that have been repurposed to something else that have excess land that they no longer need. Huge opportunities. Businesses, gas stations, anyone underutilizing excess land. And get to know owners of bigger properties in your market. So this is another deal that I'm currently doing with a totally different owner. This was completely off market. I was the only one that, that got to look at this. The building on the left is another old school that has been converted to a retirement home. And you can see right there on the right, I superimposed our, our building on the satellite view, right? The mixed use project that we're finishing. And so here, we're carving off land and we're gonna build nine high-end townhomes. Brick, rooftop decks, views of the skyline. These are gonna sell for over $700,000 each. On, right now, on, on land where you have excess parking that nobody's using. It's good for me, good for the nursing home owner, good for the city, adds to their tech space, and then adding much needed housing stock to the area, right? Ton of opportunities there like this, ton. But you've gotta to learn to spot, you gotta to learn to look at properties differently, right? If anybody wants to move to Churchill, see me after. Yeah. And, and so the online driving for dollars there's a specific neighborhood you're interested in. You can spot those opportunities just by doing online driving for dollars. Look at the satellite view of these properties. You don't have to leave your house, right? That's one way to find them. All right, teardowns, repositioning. Uh, you guys are all familiar with what a teardown is, right? You see a piece of crap, you wanna tear it down, build something new in its place. Given how hot the market is, it's very hard to make the numbers work where you buy a teardown and you replace it with one house, right? It's pretty tough these days. So, and because you need to be able to purchase the house for at most what the land is worth plus the cost of demo, right? Am I saying that correctly? You gotta take the value of the land, subtract the cost of demo, that's the most you can pay for the teardown. That's hard in most markets right now. Sellers want too much. So this works right now best in conjunction with some form of increasing density. You tear down one, you build two, you tear down one, you build four. So bonus points, if you can go in there and if you can tear something down and if you have buy right zoning to increase that density, right? If you don't have to go through a rezoning process. If, you, if there's a house that you can buy right, tear down and build two houses in this place, four houses, four duplexes, whatever, those are great opportunities. This is, I know these are dark pictures, but this was a single family ho house that I tore down and I had zoning to build a duplex in its place. So I replaced one house with two units. That was by right. If not, you increase density via rezoning. Again, you're gonna, you're gonna see some junker that they want 80 grand for. It doesn't make any sense to pay 80 grand for it. By the time you get done renovating it, put it in the market, you'll have no profit in it. So you pass on it. But it sits on a huge piece of land. So you put it under contract, contingent on being able to split that huge lot into four. This is an extreme example, but it's, it's been done, right? Now, before you ever break ground on anything by getting this rezoning approved, you've just tripled the value and bought something that everybody else couldn't make numbers work on. Even if you split this into two and not four, right? Can you pay 80 grand for that house now? Yeah. So this, this is an example of, of a teardown and repositioning. This is a medical office building that I closed on What's today is March, at the end of January, and, and in mid-February we had a special use permit approved. This is a satellite view of this medical office building. And we're gonna replace it with this. So special use permit just got approved to do that. So we're gonna split that lot into 12, and we're gonna put eight single family houses there. The, the houses on the left are gonna be three stories, again, decks overlooking skyline, 
four duplexes in the middle with eight rental units, and then two more for sale houses right there. So what do you guys like better? Um, this or this? Uh, this or this? This or this? <laughs> this or this? Yeah. I like that better. But, but this, is why, this is why this works. These are the numbers. This seller was super reasonable. They were asking uh, about double what it was worth on a good day. Double, right? The building by itself as a shell would have been worth about $400,000 at most if I was generous. The land by right I could split into five lots and each lot were being worth about 80, 80 some grand, again worth $400,000. So the seller wanted double. You can pass on it, which is what, what most people would do. I said, look, Mr. Seller, I can't, I can't give you what you want because your building is worth $400,000. Because what? I can't give you what you want because, as, as my consigliere Jason says, you're crazy. But I can, I can get a lot closer if you give me a 12-month contract for me to file a special use permit. So our contract will be for 12 months contingent on the special use permit going through. If I can rezone it into 12 lots, I will pay you $620,000. So as soon as the special use permit went through, before I put any shovels into the ground, right, I increased the value of my purchase by $340,000. Could I have paid him eight fifty dollars for it? I'm glad I didn't, <laughs> right? But, but I could have by being creative, right? So, <laughs> I, 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 I love animated gifts. They're, they're the best. All right, this is the last one, all right, before we get to Q&A. The market. So, there, there are no deals in the market. It's just all trash. Everybody wants too much. It's all overpriced, right? Who here agrees with that? Like, just give up. Don't even look at MLS. Don't even look in the market. Again, remember, may, maybe that statement is true when it comes to single-family houses, rehabs, right? That statement is probably true. It's very hard to find good deals in MLS right now. It's hard to find good deals in LoopNet. But again, remember, finding development opportunities is as much about seeing things that other people don't see. So, this was on the market for over a year. Everybody, everybody saw this deal. Every, this, it was everywhere. This was in the market for over a year. Everybody saw the medical office building. I saw something else. I'm not saying I'm some sort of a genius, but I've trained myself to try to see what could be there instead of just what is, because that's how you make money in development. This was in the market for a year. Building a five-unit building right now, this was in the market. I bought this land. This was in the market for like two years. Nobody wanted it. I bought it for $830,000 at the end of 2016. We just got it reappraised for $2.4 million because we're applying for construction. On the market for years. It was in a neighborhood that people didn't quite understand, a location that wasn't quite in demand yet, right? The very edge of Church Hill. Uh, so if you know Richmond. Actually, a great location that was already zoned 430 units. It was already, it was already entitled. Nobody wanted it tripled in value before I ever did anything to it. If I was smart, I would just sell it, but I like developing it. Um, I, you know, I bought this last summer. This was the market for years. Now, and this is basically next door to my 130 units in literally one of the hottest neighborhoods in Richmond right now. I didn't pay him what he wanted, right? I didn't pay him close to what he wanted. And this land has some challenges, right? It's got challenging topography and some soil conditions that going into it we're aware of, but we priced that into our purchase. This was the market for years, and it is five acres of already entitled land that's zoned for 207 units in Richmond. You can't find that. Right? You can't find that. I can, break, I can apply for a permit tomorrow and build 207 apartments here. On the market for years. So you've got to be able to see things that other people don't see and be creative, right? It's, it's a game of creativity. That's it. That's how you can get a hold of us. That's all I got for you.
Oh, I think he's got a whole lot more, don't you? <laughs> yeah, we didn't even talk about Rehab Valuator. Let's just go to the Rehab Valuator. I mean, like, I knew Daniel before Rehab Valuator. Like, we'd go to lunch and you'd have it and you, you were using it. Yeah. But think of the, all the people you've helped and just through that side of the business. So thank you for doing no, that my, as well. No, my pleasure. I mean, yeah, we were in that bus in 2008. <laughs> Long time ago. All right, we've got some questions. All right, here yeah. we go. All right. Here we go. I know you do new builds. How long do you anticipate keeping those new builds before you may sell them because maybe maintenance problems or? Uh, we build with the intention of keeping everything for a very long time. Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not merchant builders. There's, there's a whole subset of builders that are merchant builders. They build apartment buildings and they sell them right away to investors. Everything I develop, I intend to keep for a long time. Like 20, 30 years? 20, 30 years, may, maybe longer, may, maybe through generations if I can get my kids interested in the business. It's a little too early to tell <laughs> for, for that, so. And, hey, I will say yeah. the only thing he's yeah. better at building other than buildings is, a, is an amazing family and they just had a newborn like two weeks ago, right? Yep, yep. So everyone yeah, we, give a little clap for that one. Thank you, thank you. We, 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 we figured out what's causing it, and I think we're done, so. <laughs> Number three. Uh, questions, okay. Yeah, what do you recommend to start for people who just start? Uh, what would I recommend for people that are just starting? Start small, right? Start with a single family house. Start with a duplex. Start with something that you can build by residential building code that doesn't require a lot of cash. These duplexes, my average cost of land, right now it's higher. I'm probably paying 50, 60 grand per lot for my duplexes. You can, in different places, pick them up for 20, 30 grand, right? In locations that make sense for new construction. All of you guys are generating cash. You're generating cash through wholesaling, house flipping, your jobs, you can all come up with 20, 30 grand and then, sorry David, but go to a local bank and get a construction loan and we fund almost 100% of our construction locally with banks by bringing land as equity into the deal. So I, I can spend 30, 40 grand on a piece of land and then get the rest fully financed and stay at 65% loan to cost, uh, sorry, LTV, right? So my total cost is less than 65%, so I'm not over leveraged. But it doesn't take a ton of cash to, to start and start small. Land as your equity piece, got it. All right, here we go. Thank you for your insights, great information. I have a couple questions. You showed multiple photos up there of rural land, but I'm not hearing you say that you're actually developing rural, so that's my first question. Are you doing no, this none of the stuff I showed is, is rural. Everything I'm doing is infill development, right? Okay. So downtown urban core where we already have utilities at the street. Okay, so you're looking yeah. for infrastructure already in place for what you're doing? Preferably, yeah. I do not develop raw land, put in subdivisions, put in roads, curb, gutter, any of that stuff. Okay. Second, not to say that I won't, but I, I don't. Understood. Second question is the one that you showed where you did like 12 lots in the mm -hmm. negotiation. You mentioned something about 12 months for special use. I, I think I heard that, the permit. Yeah. Did you have it under contract and already paid for it while you were doing that? Or did you have a contract with the person you purchased it from with the intention of it? So I, I didn't... No, that's a good question. So the way we structure it is I put it under contract. Closing was contingent on us having the special use permit approved no later than 12 months. And actually what happened was because of delays with COVID, my special use permit took 13 months. And so I, I reached out to the seller and they said, will you extend the deal? And the seller said, no, because other people started beating down his door to buy that property after we got under contract. So he said, I will not extend it for you. So then I had to make a decision, right? Is this special use permit likely to get approved? How likely? Because I had to close on it before, before we got approved and I had to take a chance. Because, you know, if you, if you do, if you do business in Richmond City, then you feel my pain, but everything takes four times as long and six times as painful as it should be. So, you know. Um, and when you did that contract with the yeah. special use permit, what type of due diligence or earnest money 
that you have to put up knowing that there was a risk that you would not get approved for everything. And then second, as in what was mm -hmm. your commitment regardless of what you got? And then second, when you talk about special use permitting, um, how challenging was that and what type of money did you get going yeah. from what was there to the 12 that you looked at? And again, thank you for your time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I put, if I remember correctly, I put $20,000 down and that $20,000 uh, went hard if we didn't close, right? Meaning they were gonna get it no matter what. And, and I had to do that to make the seller comfortable and show them that, that we were serious. Um, and then, you know, special use permit was where I was most active as the initial phase of getting with my architect and working on that design. Because before we ever apply for a special use permit, we need a set of drawings. And once the special use permit is approved, they're gonna hold us to those set of drawings. What the buildings look like, uh, lot configuration, uh, exterior materials that we're promising to use. So before we ever filed, and that's why I needed 12 months. Special use permit may take usually seven, eight months, but I needed a few months with my architect, right, to be able to come up with a full set of drawings that we can submit to the city. So that, that's where I was most active, is in working with architect and make sure that we have a great plan in mind. So I, Good questions. Anyone else? Here we go. Got one here. First of all, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, I know you do a lot more higher end, um, it looks like, construction. Um, what has been your experience adding affordable housing as a way to increase density in an area? It's, that, that's a great question. I, I haven't. I guess it's a short answer. We, we don't have, um, we have an, a density bonus in Richmond that very few people have taken advantage of because it really hasn't been impactful. Um, so I, I haven't done any form of affordable housing because anything that resembles affordable housing right now requires a huge amount. Well, no, let me, let me take it back. The, I'm lying to you. The project with the nine townhomes that I just showed you guys, uh, we originally were going to split it into eight lots. But when you, you're constantly negotiating, if you want something special from your local zoning department, it's a back and forth with your local county planning department. In this case, it was the head of city council. And she's a big proponent for affordable housing. So in order to get the special use permit done, we have to make her happy. So we are taking one of the lots, splitting into two, and then adding a ninth unit there. And I'm actually making two of the smaller lots into affordable houses. We're gonna sell them, ah, oh God, they're gonna be worth probably 450. We're gonna sell them for 300 each which is gonna fall just under like 100% AMI, which is actually still considered affordable because that's the missing middle that most people like can't target anymore. If you're in Richmond City, if you're the 100% of area median income, you actually can't afford most houses in the market. That's, that's the sad part. So yeah, so that's, that's one example of how we're doing that and it's really because of necessity in dealing with the city and getting a special use permit approved. You had mentioned that you include short-term rentals and several of the multifamily. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, do you just, how do you decide how many you're gonna put in there or do you just, just random? Uh, well, it, so what, I, what I've realized with Airbnbs is it's incredibly location dependent. I see people do Airbnbs in like the weirdest locations. We have only done Airbnbs in that mixed use development that I showed you, which is insanely amenitized. Right? The neighborhood is our amenity. You walk out of the street and there's coffee shops, bars, restaurants, just the neighborhood is the attraction. So we're, we're able to get incredibly solid bookings. Location makes a big difference. So over there, we did Airbnbs. We felt very safe doing it because of the location, but also it was in that project, it was almost a necessity to make our numbers, to beef up our numbers because, because of how expensive it was. And so that location is the only location where I'm going to do Airbnbs in the foreseeable future because that's the only place where I feel solid that we will have demand no matter what, right? Because it's just, it's a no-brainer. It's located better than almost any hotel in Richmond in terms of being able to walk out the door and the amenities that you can walk to. So, so that's, that's, that's probably the biggest piece of advice, right? When you choose your Airbnbs and where they're doomed, it's, it's more about location than long-term rentals, far more about that. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, just 
question, well, three actually. Um, the average cost to split a lot, it's probably dependent on the size, right? But um, average cost to split a lot and um, the average cost to build a side-by-side -side duplex from ground up and a demo cost. Hmm. So splitting the lot, it's really just a matter of filing fees. So I'm gonna have a surveyor, fee. I'm gonna have to pay my surveyor a couple of hundred dollars to create a survey showing that lot split. And then if I don't, if it's a buy right split, then it's a matter of just getting it to the city and recording it. So it's under a thousand bucks. If I have to do a sp special use permit, right, then, then my, it's, it's a few grand that I'm spending to get a special use permit through. You look, you look surprised as if the, yeah. 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 It it's just fees, yeah. Um, do, your other two questions. So my, when we talk about duplexes, my duplexes are up and down. So I have an apartment on the first floor, I have an apartment on the second floor. We don't do side by side. One of the reasons being it's not efficient from a land use perspective. And also because if they're side by side, they're two stories, now I need a two zone HVAC system, my costs start going up. So duplexes that I built, they're, they're up and down. No, easier, really? easier. Yeah, people, people want to be up because they don't want to hear people above them. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm finishing a project now where we're coming in. I mean, I'm happy to share that. We're coming in probably at about 125 a foot all in. And that's after paying a general contract, 125 a foot to build, including my soft costs. But again, that, you know, depending on what market you're in, depending on where you're building, depending on your relationships. I, I mean, I used to build them for 75. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I used to build them for 75. Now, 120, 125 a foot, I'm happy. Because our values have grown. The, the, I mean, again, I'm happy to share the numbers. I'm, I'm finishing. On the very first slide, I had a picture of two duplexes side by side. My, my all-in cost to build those is going to be about 600 grand, right? They're going to appraise for like 540 each, meaning 600 cost appraisal is going to be 1.1 million on these things. So that's why I keep saying like find opportunities to build by residential building code, single families, duplexes, anything that you can build by residential code. It's a lot cheaper than if you're building by commercial. When I when I build my apartments, I'm paying right now 160 to 180 a foot to build by commercial code. It's just it's a lot more expensive from engineering all the way through the construction. So. Well, it's, yeah. Well, it's, it's all relative, right? You go to Denver and they pay 400 bucks a foot to build something, but their rents are three times the size as ours, right? So it's all relative, right? You just, you gotta, you gotta learn, you gotta learn your market. Um, oh, yeah. Call, I'm sorry, cost for what? You know, a single family house, we can demo for under eight grand, all in. I just took down. Man, that's a great strategy. It, it, how about this, if I demo and sell it, I may, yeah. Are you offering to come demo stuff for eight grand? <laughs> Do you have a basement? Hauling off is expensive, so yeah. Um, I was going to say, speaking for myself and maybe other people here, um, there's an intimidation factor when you get into SUPs, zoning especially when you throw in the wrinkle that you must deal with all the time with an architectural review. Mm. Can you speak to the process of dealing with both of those aspects and then, I don't want to say how easy is it, right? But like, you know, yeah. the hurdles or whatever when you get into that kind of issue. So what I would say about special use permits first and foremost, and, and in your county, it's, it might be called something else, right? Special use permits is what it's called in Richmond City. Again, you go to Henrico across the border, it's a conditional use permit. First and foremost, before you even file, take the temperature of the neighborhood and take the temperature of your local planning department. Because if you're gonna face a ton of neighbor, and then you gotta take the temperature of your local council people. Because maybe the planning department is on board, maybe the council person is on board because higher tax base, more density, but the council person is really sensitive to a few vocal neighbors. You're gonna spin your wheels for a year and you'll be dead in the water. Right, I just, I just squashed an SCP in Southside because of that. We had a great proposal, 
not controversial at all, but a couple of difficult neighbors scared the council person and she just was not on board. She wanted us to reduce the density. So first and foremost, before you file anything, you need to take those temperatures. Neighbors, planning department. If what you want to do is okay with neighbors, but it goes against like the master plan that your county has for development, you're gonna have a hard time getting it through. So the things that we try to do normally are things that have a good shot of winning before we ever file, before we ever create plans. And that's where my zoning consultant comes in, right? I call him and I say, hey, you know this area, you know the council person here. Do you think it's realistic for us to do what I have in mind? And he'll tell me, he'll say, look, I just worked in another case where literally the pitchforks and torches came out and the guy ran out of the neighborhood meeting crying. I haven't seen them since. All right, I'm probably going to pass. I just, you know, some things are worth the fight, not, 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 not usually. So start with that. From there, it's really a matter of, you know, being able to quickly get comments back. So you need, ideally, to be working with a county or a city staff that's responsive, and then just being quick to address their comments. But if they're generally on board, it then becomes a matter of tweaking and a couple of rounds of review. And it's not difficult. But the biggest thing is you don't, in this case, you don't want to swim against, you don't want to swim upstream. You're going to have a really hard time. So, does that, that answer your question? Brian? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So, how many of you guys got this booklet when you came in, right? I haven't talked about it once, but if you open up the front cover, there is a QR code to join our inner circle. And I just want to, while Daniel's up here, point that out. You can put your phone on it. And it's $97 a month. Or Triple in price tomorrow, act fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cheap. Um, is there a six-month deal still? Like yeah, yeah. There, there's a six-month deal so there where you can save even more money when you sign up. So it's $67 yeah. a month. Jeff, you're in. Mary Hart's in. I mean, just all around the room, people are in this. And we all still hang out on the bus all the time. <laughs> so. it, I, it's just the best deal out there that I've can imagine so if you're not in there we do it once a week zoom we're going to be on next week starting by rehab rent refi okay it's an important topic isn't it yeah Would you say over the years i mean if you were starting over today and you're young you just start yeah, buying you assets and <laughs> if we were both young yeah you, when we yeah. met i was young so imagine that yeah no i mean is there any trepidation of the market or anything, just keep those fundamentals right, buy, leverage long-term, fixed rate, Do, do good deals. What, what David said in his talk yeah. is incredibly important, right? Lo lock in long-term fixed money now. If you can do fundamentally good deals now and lock in long-term financing, meaning it doesn't reset in three, four, five, even seven years, and I'm doing some deals where it resets in seven years and that's I'm, I'm comfortable, but we just refied a bunch of money into 30-year fixed. So, I mean, the longer-term debt you take on, the better. But, yeah, I mean, it's, if you can do fundamentally good deals now where you don't have interest rate risk coming up soon, do the deals. There, there's no substitute for time in owning real estate. There's absolutely no substitute for what the time will do to your portfolio and to your wealth. I mean, just, there's no way around it, right? What, what's the saying? The best time to invest in real estate was 20 years ago, yesterday, and the yesterday, second best yeah. time is today. Yeah. So, so you got to time the market or time in the market? What's more important? You can't time the market. You, so time in the market. I, I mean, I made, a, I, I made a post about this yesterday, but you, haven't we all learned that nobody can predict anything anymore? <laughs> right? Haven't we all learned literally not to listen to any predictions ever about anything? Like in the last three years? If you guys haven't learned that lesson, you, you should, right? So timing the market is very hard. Do fundamentally good deals with room for downside, protection for downside if things turn against us, and then just let time take its course. Time in the Amortization, market. appreciation that comes from NOI growth, they're, they're unbelievable. And, and the kind of leverage that you can get, not just in developing, but acquiring, doing bird deals, there's no better way to build wealth. There's just Pretty none. So. Okay, so we're going to take a 20-minute break and be back here. We'll be 10 minutes behind schedule at that point, okay? So by 10 after, we're going to start.
Everybody give a round of applause for Daniel Clayman, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.